All right, so um, what we're going to do is get into thinking about and, uh, and developing an understanding around <coughs> parenting support. Um, and then I thought I'd um, spend a fair bit of time on the relationship, actually, interestingly enough. I, I'm thinking that you guys are doing such a diverse range of projects. What really um, you have in common is the need to be able to form very effective collaborative relationships with the people you work with, um, particularly with parents. So we'll spend a fair bit of time on that and talk about uh, engagement as well. Um, so one of the things I've wanted to say about um, uh, parenting support is something sometimes helpful to kind of distinguish between the form and the function of parenting support. Indeed, a lot of parenting support or working with parents can look very similar. You know, like if you sort of were to be on the fly on the wall and look in at a service providing support to parents, you'd often find that it would look, you know, possibly something like this. But there can be, despite the fact that the form of working with parents can be very similar, you'll often find that the function can be quite different. And one of the important ways in which the function of parenting support can be different is this distinction here between parent support and parenting support. Now, I actually learnt this distinction from a UK researcher, then I have lost the reference and I cannot work out who she is. Uh, so if anybody knows this person, let me know, because it was very, very helpful uh, to me, distinguishing between the notion of parent support and parenting support. So here's the difference. The difference is, for a program orientated at parent support, what we're interested in doing is supporting the parent as an adult. We're trying to build their you know, strength, resilience, their social connectedness. We're trying to support them as a, as a, essentially as an adult human being, with the assumption being that a healthy, you know, uh, socially included, connected parent is going to be able to do a more effective job at parenting and ultimately will lead to a, a good outcome for children. So parent support is about supporting parents as adults. Parenting support is about... Um, trying to influence the parent-child interaction. So in parenting support, what we're interested in is parenting as a verb, if you like. It's actually the doing of parenting. And programs that focus on parenting support are focused on trying to influence what is going on between a, between a parent and a child. Now, I'm putting this out there as if it's some kind of very clear category, but it's often it's a bit of a continuum. And programs will have a bit of a mix of both. They'll have some parent support, they'll have some parenting support. But I think sometimes the debates that go on and some of the disagreements that go on between people who develop and deliver programs is, comes about because we're not distinguishing uh, the fundamental function of the program that, we're, uh, that we have in mind. So I thought I might just share a couple of uh, examples of what parenting support, what a parenting support um, program might look like versus what a parent support program might look like. And here what we've got is a very simple program logic. Okay, so the program logic is essentially based on what, why, why are we doing this? What is the kind of outcome that we're trying to achieve? Uh, what needs to change in order for that outcome to be achieved? What is it that we're trying to influence? And the how is, well, what is the mechanism? How are we supporting the change? How will we make sure that the what will happen? And then the who is, well, who are we targeting? Who, is, who, is the, who, are, who are the people? What is the context? What is the issue that we're interested in? And if we were to think about uh, parenting support, then it might look something like this. Uh, we have a particular group we're focused on, maybe young teen mums might be an example, uh, of infants, so we understand the target group in the context. If we're doing parenting work, we'd be focused on the mum-infant relationship. There might be some aspect of the intervention that's about strengthening or enhancing that relationship. What we're trying to do is change the nature of the way the relationship actually occurs. That's the what that we're looking to change. This how might be something like, um, uh, what would be the example, might be something like uh, helping the parent uh, learn new skills around interacting with their baby, how to stimulate their baby's development through talking and through affection and so on. And the what is, that's what we're trying to change, and ultimately we're trying to change that to change child outcomes. And most parenting support programs will follow a logic that looks like that. Um, to be successful, we have to have the parenting element that has to be the thing that's being targeted, the specific parenting element which, which we know is associated with the child outcomes. 
If it's not, if we're targeting the wrong parenting element, then we're not going to achieve the outcome. All right? Um, I'll give you some examples in, in programs in a second. So this is what a parent support logic model might look like. And you see that often the why is a little bit more convoluted here. Ultimately, almost all parent as parent type programs are about improving child outcomes because otherwise why would we be working with parents? I mean, if it was about adult outcomes specifically, potentially that is being delivered by another part of our health and welfare sector anyway. Well, I'll come back to that. Um, so improved child outcomes will result from parent-child interaction. You might recognise that here. Uh, but what we are thinking is, is that if we can improve the adult well-being in some way, adult functioning, then that will lead to that and that will lead to that even if we're not directly addressing that. So the what will be some aspect of adult functioning. So if we're doing a program for, say, depressed parents, then one of the things we might be doing is simply trying to improve um, their state of mind, trying to deal with the depression. Um, and so the how we might do that, well, that might be person-focused work rather than relationship-focused work. So we're actually helping the person develop their um, coping skills. Uh, and the target group would be the people who are experiencing that particular concern or that issue. So that's parent support. Does that, does that make sense? All right. OK, so let me take you through a couple of examples of work from the Parenting Research Centre. The first one is small talk. And this, is a, um, this was an initiative that was designed to um, help supportive playgroups. Do you guys have supportive playgroups? They're like they're kind of informal early education services where parents come for two hours and there'll be a couple of facilitators. They differ from community play groups in the sense that they will be facilitated groups. They're not parent education groups. They're actually built around play. So the, the mothers and the, the children, mainly mothers, but it's open to... Um, we don't get very many fathers, unfortunately, but the idea is for parents to participate in this. Um, and the, the, in the past, playgroups have been about, you know, providing opportunities for the children to have, um, uh, you know, stimulating activities and be involved in stimulating uh, development-enhancing activities. But it's also been thought of as being really important for connecting parents, to provide them with social support and connection into the community. Now, what we were asked to do by the Victorian government was to see whether or not we could make a supportive playgroup more effective at enhancing the home learning environment. So could we use this opportunity that we have with parents to help them develop skills that would enable them to promote their children's development at home more effectively? So let's have a look at the program logic for something like small talk. So the target group was disadvantaged families, all right, because this is where we thought we could make the, the biggest difference. So the, the supportive playgroups are provided already to families who are experiencing some kind of adversity. It might be a social adversity or it might even be a child-related adversity, excuse me, like um, a child with a disability. Uh, the how, we used a coaching methodology. So we identified five key kind of parenting essentials that the research shows are linked to child, children's uh, learning of language and their learning of, and their cognitive skills. The five essentials were tuning in, following a child's lead, talking and listening, teachable moments, and warmth and gentleness. The idea of the intervention was to say, could we help these families increase the frequency of interactions that included aspects of these behaviours, right? Based on that kind of Hart and Risley work that I shared with you um, just before. And the method we used was coaching, and we did it in two ways. One was in the group, and so the, instruct the facilitators were supported in developing coaching strategies. So in-group coaching strategies. They were simple strategies like just pointing out to parents when they're in fact using one of the skills. Hey, when you did that, did you notice that? Or that might be kind of reinforcement. Hey, that was a great example of tuning in. Or it might be incidental teaching. This could be a moment where we could use tuning in. What do you think? All right. So they were very low key strategies, but we also used home coaching. So there was a six session home coaching program where a worker went into the home and coached the parents on these particular skills. And so what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve a change in the quality of, of daily interactions. All of these parents talk to their kids. They all uh, demonstrate affection to them. They all. Um, uh, um, 
uh, use teachable moments. The difference between children doing well and children not doing quite as well is the frequency of the interactions. So our, our, our logic was if we could increase simply the amount of language children were exposed to, the number of times they had an opportunity to explore something they were interested in, then we would be improving ultimately their cognitive and language outcomes. All right? Now, Ideally, what we do is we use, when we're designing programs like this, I mean, all of us, we're using evidence to help build the program, logic. You know, we want to see, for example, there is evidence that language is related to parent-child interaction, and there is. Then we want to see evidence that what we are doing will possibly change that, all right? So that ultimately this causes this, which causes that, okay? Does that make sense? Now, I know you guys, as part of what you're doing, needing to be kind of uh, spelling out the program logic of your work, how, does, how is your work going to achieve the outcome? And this may be um, kind of thing that you might ultimately have to uh, pay attention to. Here's another example. This is a parent support approach. And this was a project that we did with um, the Royal Children's Hospital in, um, in uh, Melbourne. Um, it was a project that was working with parents of children who have life-threatening illness and injury. And so the hospital had developed a screening measure which would help them identify parents who were really at risk of developing a serious mental health problem based on their child's, uh, the threat to their child's life, which, by the way, I don't know how anybody stays you know, psychologically healthy in that situation, but it actually turns out the majority of parents will cope with something like this. They'll get through it, even though it's traumatic. There's a small number who will develop a significant uh, mental health problem, and there's a group in the middle that could go either way if they don't get the right support. Now, the problem with developing a mental health problem if you've got a really ill child is you, it's very difficult for you to provide the support and the care to the ill child because you're struggling with your own uh, emotions and, um, and, and difficulties. So the, the hospital had identified a way of identifying these parents at risk and the program involved inviting those at-risk parents to participate in a program. And the program was designed to improve or enhance their coping skills to help them deal with the stress and trauma of the situation they were going through. Okay, so this is the program logic for a parent support approach. Um, so for us, uh, the who is parents of children with life-threatening illness at risk of a mental health disorder. So it's a, quite a specific group. And by the way, the more specific we can get in our program logic, the better, all right? Because we're getting clearer on who it is that we're uh, trying to help and at what point we're trying to help. In fact, the point we're trying to help is really critical. Are we doing prevention? Or are we doing treatment is a really important question. Is this about dealing with a target group who already have an established issue that we're trying to help them move through? Or is it about preventing a target group from experiencing a, a, um, a particular issue? Being very clear about where this fits on the prevention scale is important. Um, the, the, the actual how we used was a, an approach called acceptance commitment therapy. And this is a branch of cognitive behavioural therapy, a new development in cognitive behavioural therapy, where the emphasis is more on um, mindfulness and developing a new relationship to your internal life. It's about handling your emotions without letting your emotions handle you, to put it really, really simplistically. If you've had any experience with mindfulness, you know, meditation or anything like that, you have a bit of a flavour of what this is about. It's so an emerging, emerging approach with um, some evidence building around it. We thought it would be potentially valuable here. So our program, which, by the way, was a group program, it was based on this idea of using acceptance commitment therapy. The what we're trying to get at is improve coping skills. So we're trying to give the parents some skills in handling the stress of their situation. And ultimately, the why is improved mental uh, health outcomes. And... Um, Ultimately, and we're working with the Royal Children's Hospital, they're obviously interested in how that will ultimately translate to the children um, doing, doing better. Um, so this is a parent support approach. By the way, um, the group thing didn't really work um, because parent, parents have to come from all over the state. Victoria is a pretty big state, so they have to come all over the state to the hospital. And uh, trying to get them to attend a group on top of all of the medical appointments they had to do just turned out to be unrealistic. So we introduced iPad therapy. I kid you not, iPad therapy. So what happened was is we bought iPads 
and we would post them off to the families uh, who agreed to participate. And the iPad would arrive in the mail, and they could take the iPad out, they could turn it on, and it had all the software to enable them to participate in a group. So we literally had you know, parents sitting around their coffee table, you know, in their dressing gowns and whatever, participating in a program, right? It was a webinar-style thing. They could see other participants, and they could see a facilitator. And it was totally based on, on iPads, but that's a little bit by the by. By. The by. Something that's worth us thinking about, how we're using technology to reach families. You know, we had 100% father involvement, talking about fathers. You know, because you imagine, you've got a child who's very sick, often you're the one who's got to hold the fort together. You're looking after the other kids, you're bringing in the, you know, the, the income, you can't afford to be dropping everything. You can't keep your job if you're going to take sick leave every second day. So often fathers are not engaged, but we found this particular method was much more successful in engaging fathers. They could participate in this, in this way. Uh, while I'm on a roll, I think logistical issues are often the biggest issue around engagement. It's purely logistics. How you get somebody there, how you get somebody who's got a child with complex needs to be able to put aside five or six you know, weeks in a row to work on something is a very big ask. So anyway, we can kind of reduce the friction involved in engaging, um, the, the better. So there's an example of a parent support approach. All right, and as I said earlier, sometimes what you'll get is you'll get a bit of both because one way we've found of helping, for example, depressed parents is to help them get feel more confident in the way they're handling their kids. If they're dealing with the situation more effectively, they start to feel better about themselves. So it sometimes overlaps. The parenting work helps the parent, uh, and sometimes what we need to do is do the parent support work as well. Um, can I just say, uh, if you're sort of wondering, start with the parenting support work, because it often can make such a huge difference to a family's life that you don't need to add the parent support component, but then there'll be times when you do. Listen, one of the, one of the dilemmas we often still face is you'll talk to a policymaker who'll say, no, we're, we're not doing stuff for parents, we want to do stuff for kids, right? I don't know if you experienced that. And that's why we are still banging on about this idea that parenting is about kids. Like it's about raising kids. It's, it's child focused. So this is the difference between, sometimes I think we get confused about who we're working with and what we're trying to achieve. So in parenting work, we're working with parents to bring a change for the child. So it is about the child, as opposed to working with the child directly, individually, to help bring about the change for them. All right, and so we're often saying to policymakers, if you want to make the biggest difference for children, often the best place to start is working with their parents, because they're the ones who are the change potential change agents. They have the biggest influence, and so on. Okay, so there's one aspect of program design to keep an eye on. What are we doing? Are we doing parent support? Are we doing parenting support? I would tell you, parenting support's more expensive. You can often achieve good parent support in playgroups. We have in, in Australia first-time parent groups, you know, where parents are sort of organised by their nurse to sort of get together. They're basically completely independent groups. They just meet and often form very good relationships that last a long time. And it costs very, very little. It costs the state very, very little. The magic is in the peer support. It just goes on. You don't need too much professional help. But with parenting support, it tends to be more expensive because often the professionals you need to be involved uh, at a higher level, you have to pay them more. It's more costly and so on. So parenting support tends to be more expensive, which is why I think in this country, uh, in Australia anyway, it's starting to become more targeted. We're trying to build universal parenting supports that are the less costly, that everybody can participate in, and then target our parenting work more specifically. Another uh, important distinction when you're thinking about designing or delivering a program is the idea of the program being built on a parenting model or a parent-mediated model. So a parent model or a parent-mediated model. And it looks a bit like this. In a parent-mediated model, Essentially, what the parent is being helped to do is deliver therapeutic strategies, right? Often therapeutic strategies that have been developed from a therapeutic approach. And it's like, in this kind of model, it's like parent as co-therapist, parent as extension to the therapist. So you think about maybe an early childhood intervention program uh, where we've got, say, a speech pathologist. The speech pathologist might be working with the parent 
what they're doing is helping the parent develop strategies for promoting their children's language development. And what they might be doing, for example, is teaching the parent how to use a signing program with their child to help support and um, uh, promote the child's development. That would be a parent-mediated uh, model. Um, another example, I think, is programs, some of those common uh, programs like Incredible Years and the Positive Parenting Program. These actual programs arise out of therapeutic interventions for children with behavioural problems. They actually arise out of behavioural therapeutic uh, programs. And so what we're doing there is sharing the strategies that have been found useful in clinical intervention work with parents who can then use them with their children, parent-delivered therapeutic strategies. Now, the other type of model that you, we can use is more a parenting model. And that's where we, we work from a, a basic understanding of what is it the parents do that promotes their children's development and learning, or what is it they do that helps them in this particular area. Once we know what they do, then what we do is we help them do that more, or we help them do that. So it's coming more from naturalistic understandings of the way parent-child relationships develop. Um, so the small talk program I just mentioned then is very much a, a parenting model. It started using evidence about what parents do anyway, and then the intervention became how do we support the, the parents who may not be doing it as much to do that more. I think a lot of the attachment-based work that you might be familiar with is more of a parenting model. Some of it actually is influenced by psychodynamic psychotherapy, so there is that influence. But often now what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, work come up from un our un growing understanding of child development, and that's informing the design of the program. Does that make sense? Um, and I think understanding the difference can be quite helpful. I'm not suggesting one is better than the other, all right? They're just different. Um, and ultimately, what what's best, we need to let the evidence decide. But they are different. Uh, and that's, you'll notice that, and you'll sometimes hear it coming up in the debates about parenting programs. The debates, uh, we're having this sort of debate because we're kind of not understanding that we're starting from a different place, looking to try and achieve a different thing. A uh, third dimension I, I like to think about, uh, or think about when I think about parenting support, is the difference between programs and practice. Um, programs and practice. Um, so, um, let's start with talking about programs. I mean, first of all, what is a program? A program is, is essentially a, a body of content combined with some kind of change process delivered as a package. A program tends to be a package. It tends to have a beginning and it has an end, and it brings together both the key content that's felt to be important in supporting the change and the key process elements that are, that, are, that are about supporting that. What we just heard there was a program, all right? It was a, it was a package. Um, and um, in the parent work, uh, often you'll um, find that a program like Tiny, Tiny Jim or a program like uh, the Positive Parenting Program, Triple P, or a program like the Incredible Years, or a program like Signposts, or whatever, what these, you'll find that these programs, particularly the proprietary ones with a brand on them, are actually related to each other, particularly if they're focused in a particular area. All right, they'll be part of a class of programs, and those programs I just mentioned, Incredible Years, Triple P, um, yeah, uh, parent-child interaction therapy, uh, or a lot, there's a number of them, are actually very similar in the sense they're based on the same underlying program logic. All right, there'll be some differences, but they are basically, they, they are part of a class of programs. And that class of programs will often then be related to an underlying practice base. All right, so the programs I just mentioned are related to, broadly related to, work done in applied behaviour analysis, work done in social learning theory, work done in behavioural interventions. All right, they all come from the same root core source. All right? And I think this is very interesting, because sometimes we get debates about you know, which program is better than another, which program should we be doing, and it's worth having those discussions, I'm sure. But sometimes it's helpful to think of, well, actually, maybe we could be having a more productive conversation about more the class of programs, or even better, the body of practice that underpins a program. 
because it might be that we can be more effective by flexibly delivering on, flexibly designing approaches which are based on evidence-based practice than just simply thinking, how do I, you know, what, what, what do I pull off the shelf? You know, what, what pre-packaged thing do I pull off the shelf? And if you're thinking about the difference between taking on pre-packaged approaches or developing your own, I think it can be useful to kind of have a sense of what are the advantages and uh, disadvantages of programs and practice and what, how, how are they different. Um, what programs tend to do is they tend to focus on the, the what and the how. All right? So as I said before, they're kind of pre-packaged. Whereas practice responds or deals mainly with how, leaving the what to the professional and the parent to kind of work out. So I was thinking, say we take parents with an intellectual disability as an example. Uh, we have developed a program called Parenting Young Children, which is a program for parents of, who have an intellectual disability to help them in their parent-child interaction. All right? It's a program. It's a package. So a professional can pick it up and use that. But also what we've tried to do is identify what are the key aspects of good practice in working with parents who have an intellectual disability. One really important thing with parents who have intellectual disability is that we provide the right kinds of learning experiences for them. Typically, if they're just given talk therapy, if they're just given loose um, kind of support, loose emotional support or just how are you doing this week type, type support, it doesn't make much difference. But if parents who have an intellectual disability get the chance to learn things in a structured way with learning prompts like visual prompts, practice, rehearsal, shaping, practice, rehearsal, shaping, then it could be a lot more effective. So we could say, here are the practices that you need to use when you're working with a parent with intellectual disability uh, quite outside of what the content might be because we might be working with one parent on maybe how to, how to prepare uh, baby bottles uh, and working with another parent about you know, how to deal with their 11-year-old who's talking back at them, you know, something like that. Um, one of the things about a program is it tends to be fixed, whereas a uh, practice can be a little bit more flexible, and there are advantages sometimes to having more flexible practice. Working with parents of children with a disability, say an early childhood intervention, they're not all lining up because they want help with behaviour. Sometimes they want help with other things. And we can't just sort of put them all through the one program. So we have to be able to adapt what we're doing to each parent. And their practice can be a good way of, of going. And then uh, the final thing, which I've probably talked about, is that programs tend to be pre-packaged, pre whereas practice can uh, be tailored. But there are, there are some really... Um, uh, big benefits of programs. One is technology transfer. So with a program, often what we can do is transfer what one professional group can do to another professional group. So we did a thing with a program called Signpost, which was designed by clinical psychologists in a university setting, and we got the chance to evaluate it, and it did all right. And then we got some funding to roll it out across the community. But this time, the program was being delivered by teachers and by others who don't have psychological training. Guess what we found when we compared our results? The teachers did a better job than the clinical psychologists, which was great. The professors were really impressed by that. <laughs> by that. But the teachers here didn't have to do a clinical psychology degree to get a handle on the principles and the strategies. The program enabled them to be effective because it was pre-packaged and given to them, and if they delivered it, it got the results that they, that they were kind of looking for. So one great aspect of programs is diffusion of ideas and practice and, and strategies across a, a wider range of people. Um, one of the advantages of practice, though, is this is more in a continuous quality improvement kind of thing. And sometimes what we're just trying to do is just improve our practice day in and day out. And sometimes thinking about and adopting changes in our practice is the way to get to continuous quality improvement. Injecting programs, sort of just plopping them in, it can be problematic like that because of the amount of time that's required to sustain them, learn them and you know, manage them. Uh, whereas if we take a practice approach, we can look at incremental improvement. And I'd really encourage a practice type approach in settings like early childhood intervention, where we're working with families on an individual basis, tailoring our approach to them, focusing more on practice rather than um, necessarily programs, although there are probably programs that would also help. <laughs>